So the, this assertion of individuality is seen as a zero sum game. In other words, if, if you have this thing, whatever it is, control or power or position or some designation of guru or enlightened or whatever, you know, then I can't have it. And if I have it, you can't have it. You know, like, like the universe is ain't big enough for both of us. <laughs> that's right. Now, that's why I uh, have the internet uh, address that I have. I'm at Infinite Pi. And the thing about Infinite yeah, Pi, inf there's enough for everyone. And so that to me seemed to be a good basis for an internet name. That's appropriate, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But if we do our sadhana, we reduce our needs and desires. Buddha said, one should be of few wishes. You know, and you, you never hear the Buddha or Ramana, for that matter, talking about making a big organization and how are we going to grow? And, you know, yes, yes. Um, they just, whoever showed up, they would accept them for wh who they are or where they are. And, um, you know, there was no grand strategy to take over the world or anything. Um, yes. It just it grew organically. You know, yes. And like I was uh, had told you, uh, there was a time in the early years with Nomi where I saw him do something. He sent about two thirds of the people that uh, came to satsang every week away. And he sent them away basically because they were not qualified. I did the same thing when I had my ashram. Yes. I sent about half the people home. Yes. Because they, they weren't making the changes, you know? <laughs> yes. As we would say in the jazz uh, idiom, they weren't. They weren't on top of the uh, changes. They were making it. Whoops. My filter fell off. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, if someone accepts a position, whether it's as a disciple or a manager or some kind of leader or teacher or what to speak, a guru, you know, that's the big one. They have certain responsibilities, even the students. Yes. And if they don't perform them or if they cause mischief in the process, you know, what's that all about anyway? It has to be simply ego. Yes. So, yeah, living in the material world. <laughs> well, it can be a problem. I know in the last of my uh, working days, uh, I spent uh, a year or so working for a small software company and uh, for a while, they gave me the project manager job managing all the software development projects that the company was doing. Oh, my and, God. <laughs> and they were doing it in India with uh, people who were really very junior and didn't know, have the skills to do what they're doing. And what they wanted to do was work a year so they had experience so they could work someplace better. And so it was not a positive environment. And uh, what I found at that time is uh, at least management does not want an unattached project manager. So, uh, no, they want you to take all the lumps. Yes, that's that's who the project manager is a guy with a big job who has no power to do it. Yes, that's right. 
I, I learned that well. <laughs> yes. So, you know, all you can do is suggest. Right. You can't really order people around or anything because you don't have the position. Right. You're outside the org tree, you know. It's so weird. But even in, you know, in spiritual groups that are fairly simple and straightforward, and it should be clear who is in charge and, and what they're supposed to be doing. People find a way to game the system. You know, and this is a story that's probably as old as Adam and Eve. Yes. People can take a spiritual life and use it to try to attain material goals like power and wealth right. and fame and so on. Well, we can objectify anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Let's, let me tell you about today's realization and this morning's meditation. I saw very clearly that this whole world the whole material existence is just a lie. You know, it's more than just, a, it's a fabrication, but it's more than just a fabrication. It's an intensely uh, or intentionally misleading fabrication, a false promise mm -hmm. that, oh, you're going to be happy here. You're going to enjoy this material life. It's going to be wonderful. You know, it's like marketing, right? Yes. It's more like this sales. Product, yeah. This product does everything for everybody and it's perfect. And it's all, it's so cheap. We'll pay you to take it, you know? <laughs> and uh, just to get people on board. And once they're locked in, oh, that's when the, they start, you know, taking the pound of flesh, right? So that's it. People make a commitment. They accept a body. And from that point on, then they're limited to the karma of that body. Unless they get some spiritual realization beyond that, you know. Mm -hmm. But most people, most beings in the, in the world are totally in maya. They think this is all there is. This is reality. You know, this is the of the game that I have to play. And they can't see that this is this whole other realm of spiritual reality, just on the other side of the mirror, kind of, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that is unlimited and unconditioned. And in that realm, there's no doer, no individual, no, consequently, no karma. Uh, there's no coming and going, as Ramana would say. Yes. No change, transformation, or uh, any of the things that we commonly think of as being kind of uh, related with spirituality. You know, those only apply to the very lowest levels of spirituality. If anything changes, well, it's got to be objective. It's got to be material. Right. Yes. Other than, it's got to be other than the self. The yes. self doesn't change. And yes. if we find ourselves doing this and that, same argument or same principle applies. Right. So, you know, I mean, I got sucked into it big time today when my flight canceled 24 hours before departure. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> and I was scrambling to find another flight to upload all my medical stuff to um uh, change my hotel reservation. I mean, just, just innumerable yes. details connected with having a flight go like that, canceled like that. And I was like, came out of it and just took a deep breath and went, 
wait a minute, I'm not the doer. You know, this, this is happening because it's some karma. This was already designed into the world. This is not because of me or about me, you know? And it is not exactly my fault, you know? But it does become my responsibility if I don't respond to it properly, you know? So that's the game we're playing. We're, we're thrust into a world that is not designed by us, that doesn't really have the same agenda that we do, and which on top of it all is inconceivable, so complex and so deep, so ancient, you know, that we can't possibly comprehend what's going on, what's going to happen, how our lives are going to go and stuff like that. And of course, you know, we struggle to make plans and, and to do all this stuff, you know, but how is it really going to turn out? We don't know. And is, you know, astrology can help a little bit if you get good at it, but even that is very limited as to what it can reveal. And ultimately, the whole thing is simply beyond words. You know, people read all these books and they get into all these teachings and they learn so many mantras and big prayers and, and all this stuff. And, and then they think they know. <laughs> you know, but they really yes. don't know. They now, this is one of the... This is one of the things I love about Nataraj, you know, because he is there just uh, dancing and moving with the changes of the universe. And well, he, I think he is more like he is the changes of the universe. <laughs> and the idea, though, of uh, taking all of this and then just moving and dancing and flowing with it uh, is a real powerful image. And of course, around him was the ring of fire. And that didn't bother his dance at all. No, because it's coming from him. <laughs> That's right. He is yes. the Ishwar. Yes. And his dance is what burns the universe to ashes at the end of the creation. Yes. Now, Nomi uh, really uh, had a kind of connection with Nataraj because of the fire. And Nomi talked about his own personal practice as having been real fiery, by which he, of course, means he had all of this stuff, all of these ideas that he just had to burn up. Well, the, the clarity of Nomi's expression of, of his realization and mental state is so impressive, you know, especially for someone his age. He's only yes. 20 years old. Yes. And he wrote that letter to that Swami in India. Yes. My God, you know, it's scripture. Yes. It's, it's the highest quality. It's like Ribu Gita. Yes. You know, it's really, really clear. Now, Nick, if you want to know what we're talking about, if uh, somehow you or uh, Swamiji can send me your email oh. address, I have oh, a no, couple I of can, things I can send I can, you. Uh, I can forward him the files on Signal. Okay, good, good. Uh, and these are uh, letters that I found within my archive. Uh, that my teacher Nomi wrote uh, when he was 20 or 21, you know, the same age as Ramana was when uh, he had the dialogues that ended up as the books Who Am I and Vichara Sangraham. So it's just the 
very mature and deep writings of this guy who more or less was just a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Still looking for, oh, here's one. Forward. Yeah. So I had sent you three. I can't forward it because it's more than 20 years, more than 20, 24 hours long of old. Yeah, it won't let me forward it. Anyway, if you send me you uh, send Nick's it. email address, then I'll send it to him via the old fashioned way. <laughs> It's seeming like that nowadays. Whatever works. Nicholas Perez. Uh, there's which one should I use, Nick? Um, Perez yeah. two two twenty two or eight eighty eight. You could use the eight eighty eight email. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, why won't it let me copy? You know, this is the thing about iOS. Uh, yeah, what I'm trying to do, Nick, as I've gone through and I had collected things from uh, Nomi over about 20 years, including uh, a decade's worth of audios of his satsangs and things like that, and many things he wrote and transcriptions of satsangs and things like this. And I realized recently, I have all of this stuff on my computer, and I'm just trying now to find ways to be able to put it out in the world. I don't want this stuff to die on my computer hard drive. Have you ever thought of um, uploading it online? Say like YouTube, some platforms such as that? Uh, there are some things I can do. Uh, I don't think Nomi wants me to republish the things that he's already published. But one of the things that I have done is I've uh, put a couple of hundred videos of his talks, and I would basically just take his talk and put a still image over it. And uh, so I have a YouTube channel that has a bunch of that stuff in it. And uh, what I was thinking about doing after uh, talking to Swamiji about it is go back in the stuff that I have posted and then add transcripts to it. So the words are there and there's a written copy. Yeah, I like the uh, I like reading things more than actually watching videos. So yeah, me, me too, actually. Yeah. Absolutely. Part of the Richard, reason. I sent, go I ahead. I sent you an email with, with Nick's okay. email address. Okay. Okay. So I'll Thanks. I'll send you I'll send you some stuff and uh, uh, again understand it. This is uh, early communication from somebody who, like Ramana, had uh, in his teens the kind of realization that doesn't come and go anymore can't wait to get into it mm -hmm. say again i said i can't wait to get into it okay yeah yeah the the quality of his letters especially is just astonishing I mean, for somebody his age to be able to write that. 
you know, and it's so well written. It's like he had an editor. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, unprecedented, I think, is the good word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so where's the rest of the gang? I think this is the rest of the gang. Oh, okay. Running a little Just, late. Huh? So they're running a little late. Uh, I didn't promote this meeting. I didn't announce it or anything. Um, so it's not surprising you know, nobody showed up. Because I thought I was going to go to India the next day. So I would be really busy. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going tonight. <laughs> I'm leaving here at midnight. Oh. Crazy schedule. Anyway, that's my sad tale for today. <laughs> and midnight is not kids. very is not very uh, long after uh, we're gonna shut Zoom off. So after right. we shut it off, you have to get your bags and get the taxi and get to the airport. I've got a ride to the airport. I just have to throw a few things in my bag and I'm ready to go. Okay. So, uh, you know, have dinner, maybe get a little nap. And, and, then... and it's a short flight to Chennai. Yeah, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Okay. So the plane doesn't even get, I mean, barely gets up to full altitude and it has to start down a little. <laughs> So I don't have anything, any prepared remarks. Um, oh, 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 you want to hear about my dream this afternoon? This is sure. wild. Please. I had, a, I had a wild dream. Well, I told you the one that, from last night, Richard. Huh? Yes. Where we were, you and me and some other people, guys, were sitting around a table and drinking. <laughs> and, and Richard spilled his wine on the table. And somebody, one of the other guys, I'm not sure who they were, they said, hey, you better clean that up. So Richard grabbed my whiskey and poured it on top of the wine. And that was, that was supposed to clean it up, right? And we all thought this was really funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you know, the way I interpret that is that enlightenment, bliss, is like a kind of intoxication. You know, and it is. And if I didn't have to come out in the world and do so many things, that's what I would do. I would just, you know, sit around and bliss out, basically. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a corner of uh, some loka in the spiritual world where um, Richard and, and Nomi and Ramana and everybody and I are just hanging out, blissed out, you know, and uh, it's like a constant party. Yeah. But anyway, last night, oh my God, this was, I haven't figured this dream out yet. So uh, I was overlooking like a big wall with a gate in it. And suddenly there was a series of explosions a pattern of explosions all along this wall, including the gate. The whole thing was just blown into rubble in about a second. And, you know, just for emphasis, it repeated like <laughs> the playback. But my dreams are weird, you know. <laughs> and then 
these Native American Indians came charging through what was left of the gate, like a whole, you know, parade, a whole column of them with horses and wagons and bows and arrows and, you know, big feathered headdresses and the whole bit. And um, then on, on one of the wagons, there was this old guy who I identified with, or I, I, I found myself in his role, in his valence. And, and uh, you know, those kind of, um, what are they called? Parasails? Yes. Parachute that this, and, you know, yes. and you can tow it behind a vehicle and it, it, it'll go up in the air and you can fly around. Well, I was putting on one of those. <laughs> getting ready to, to, to be towed, you know, by the horse and wagon, which were at full gallop, and, uh, and go up in the air, you know. And that was the end of the dream. It just took a couple of minutes. You know, and it was so weird that the whole explosion followed by this invasion of Native Americans who played twice. I've never had a dream repeat like that. So there must be some meaning in it. And so I spent a few minutes after I woke up contemplating all this. And then I realized I knew where that wall is. And it's the compound wall along the Ganges of the Iskan Mayapur Center in Bengal their world headquarters. Mm -hmm. So what does it all mean, right? I think because, see, they are committed to dualism. I, I think it, it was a symbol that whatever dualism there is in my mind is about to be blown up. Yes. And then you're going to be lifted. On my, yeah, by the air currents, right? Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a favorable interpretation. I think that's a good interpretation. Yes, yes. I think you're right, Richard, that, you know, something is up. And all of these dreams I've had are, you know, uh, I really point to... Um, making a big breakthrough. Yes. A big realization. And so, you know, I don't know if I told Nick uh, the, the, about the other one the other night when uh, uh, my hostess had brought me some herbal tea. She's an expert with herbs. And she had brought some chamomile, no, not chamomile, coriander tea and it was very bitter so I went and got some sweetener some stevia and I was adding it to the tea and she said don't you need to stir it and so I was explaining to her that actually the stevia dissolves completely mm. and I just went into a trance I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and later on when I thought about it, what is the ego? Or what is the individuality? It's just a thought. Yes. Or a pattern of thoughts, you know, a complex of thoughts. And... Uh, so what happens when those thoughts dissolve, when they go away, you know, because uh, the whole idea, the whole concept of who I am, identity of any kind is also just a thought. Right. But the, the thought I am Brahma is a much bigger thought. It's like an ocean 
compared to the little tiny thoughts of I am this guy or I am here in this body or whatever. So that reminded me of the story of the salt doll. Mm -hmm. There's a story in the Upanishads that the salt doll wanted to find the depth of the ocean. <laughs> See, there's a tradition where they make a, a deity of Ganapati out of salt. Mm -hmm. And they paint them all fancy, you know, with lacquer and everything. And then at the end of the festival, I think it takes three days, Ganesh Puja. After three days, everybody goes down to the ocean and they put these images of Ganesh into the sea. So the story is the salt doll went in and tried to find the depth of the ocean. Well, what's going to happen? You know? And the, the lacquer is not going to protect the doll from dissolving in the sea. So the salt in the sea and the salt in the doll is of the same quality. And once the doll dissolves, you can't tell which salt came from the doll and which came from the sea. They're identical. So like in the same way, the, the consciousness or the, the thought that I am so-and-so and I am this and I am that is, is really of the same quality as the thought I am Brahman. And once the individual thought is dissolves in the ocean of Brahman, it can't be found again. It simply merges. It doesn't disappear in the sense of going away. It's still there, but it's so distributed, so dilute, so diffuse that it can't be distinguished anymore from the ocean. So this to me was like a door. This was an opening into, uh, well, it's a technique actually. If you think of the, the uh, identity or the ego as thoughts, like the salt doll dissolving into the ocean, it's a wonderful technique for letting go of the ego. So I've been using that as a technique in my meditations. Mm. And it works wonderfully. You know, <clears throat> there's a certain thing that happens um, it's sort of like pulling aside a curtain. Like there's a there's a curtain of maya illusion that screens off the Brahman. And we normally can't perceive the Brahman because we're all caught up in this screen and the things that are projected on it by the mind. I am this, I am that, I am so-and-so, this is mine. I am doing this, I am going here and there. But when that story stops, or when the screen is, is pulled aside or dissolves into Brahman. Then the, the naked Brahman then shines, the self shines. Uh, and without the, any interference from these upadi, these coverings or uh, super impositions is the word that Shankara uses. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no more superimposition of ego or individuality or material identity based on identification with the body or any of that. Uh, that all goes away. And simply the self shines. And that is the source of wisdom, you know? And, and that's what Ramana 
that's where Ramana is speaking from. That's where Nomi is speaking from mm -hmm. when he gives these wonderful, clear descriptions of his realization. You know, he's, he's not following a script. It's not like he's quoting from some book. He's simply looking and saying what he sees from where he's at. And, you know, this is the greatest thing. This is the most wonderful thing. This is what we should all aspire for, this kind of clarity. And it's beyond words. It's indescribable. I'm, words are like clumsy. It's like, like trying to do some fine work, like play a musical instrument with heavy, thick gloves on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Are using words to describe these things. It feels so clumsy and, and you know, like it just, it, it doesn't really get the essence of it. It can't. So anyway, Richard, you had something? Yeah. Now, the one thing uh, I wanted to say that also is from Nomi, Nomi's own practice, I believe, at that time, it's one of the things Nomi stressed is to uh, make your inquiry thorough. And, uh, you know, I think that is some of what you are going through right now is uh, kind of doing some cleaning up of the crumbs so that uh, you can, I don't want to say move forward because that implies some kind of direction and there's no direction in that which is directionless. But uh, I, your, the metaphor of the salt is perfect and to uh, there are might be crumbs in that salt that need to be dealt with before it can dissolve completely. So let's go get those crumbs. <laughs> I'll feed them to the dogs. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. I found out they like cream crackers. Okay. You know those so. Uh, Munchy cream crackers that every little store sells. Yes. Yeah. Apparently, they really like those. <laughs> so uh, that's great. That you know. So you'll tame those dogs. I'm going to get them. I'm going to train them. I'm going to make them my friends. <laughs> I mean, it's better than fighting them. Yes. That just that just leads to bad feelings all around. So, um, yeah, it's like, <laughs> I remember it was when it was like 2015 or 16 that I forgave all my enemies. Yes. I remember specifically because at one point, I mean, they used to make me really mad, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to get I used to get so worked up about it, but I knew that I if, if I fought them I would be descending to their level. Yes, and I didn't want to do that, so I restrained myself from fighting them or you know returning their nonsense in any way or form. But you know I still it still upset me and I still felt. Um, angry about it but then I started practicing metta yes I was gonna talk about that in my own experience uh, with metta dealing with the same exact kind of issue ah. yes I started practicing metta and um, I found myself you know wishing all these different beings 
<laughs> that they should be happy, they should attain enlightenment, they should have everything they need, they should be free, they, you know, and so on and so on. And I said, well, what about those guys? You know? right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Why not them too, you know? Does it hurt me to wish them well? No, you know? Doesn't cost me anything, right? So I started it. I started wishing them well. I started with wishing that, you know, they would get over their ignorance. They would get over their attachments. They would start to see, you know, that everybody has a different path and a different way. And that, that there's some people uh, have a different way of expressing the same love for God that they're trying to reach, you know, but they, it's just outside their limitations and that they should understand this and let go of the hate and all this stuff, you know. And it took a few weeks, but then I found myself like, you know, free of it. Yes. Free of it. And to add the icing on the cake, in the Devi Kalotra, remember that? Devi Kalotra Tantra? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I did a series on it some time ago. It was when I first came to Tiruvannamalai around that time. At the end, Shiva says, bless your enemies because then they have to take all your bad karma. <laughs> 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 if you don't hate them there's nothing they can do you know and it just like bounces off of you and comes right back to them <laughs> and so i said okay okay that's what it shiva is uh, is blessing me <laughs> so I know, and every time I do metta, then I, you know, I think of them and I forgive them. And it's funny, right around that time is when they stopped stalking me and harassing me online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something's going on behind the scenes. Yes. It's hard to pin down, but it's very subtle. Yeah. And I think it's as long as we think that uh, when somebody is angry or envious or insulting us, as long as we think that it's real. Yes. And that it requires a response. And that, that it's about it. us somehow. Right. 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 Yes. And to see to, that actually it's not about me. It's about their idea of me, which is completely something completely different. Um, that's tremendously liberating, you know? Well, also, I learned uh, at this last job, I, I worked for the worst guy I ever worked for in my life. And so I would have times where I would be in my office and he would come in the door and close the door and then yell at me because I was doing something like paying too much attention to his biggest customer taking care of their problems, which did not seem to me to be a fault. And yeah. so first I was proud that I never punched him out. And then <laughs> uh, I ended up uh, feeling like he was one of my teachers because I would go home, I would drive home after the incident with him and I would start off steaming. And then I know enough by now to know all of those reactions are ego reactions. 
And so on the drive, then I would look to see if that's really who I am, because all of these ego reactions come from some false idea of who I am. And it turns out I was never that one that was agitated to begin with. So by the time I got home after the drive, uh, thanks to the lesson that I had gotten from this uh, guy, then uh, I was peaceful and happy and some other little piece of identification was broken off thanks to his wonderful teaching. I wouldn't have gotten to it otherwise because it was stuff that was pretty deeply buried. So it yeah. took... It took uh, that kind of aggressive interaction from him to bring it out. You needed a trigger. Yeah. And so uh, I never told him that he was my teacher. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was. Well, it's like the other day with these dogs, you know? It's like I haven't studied martial arts in a long time. You know, but when that dog went to bite my ankle, man, the, the reaction was just instant. I didn't even think, you know, I just kicked his face in. <laughs> and then afterwards I felt bad, you know. Of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, then I realized now there's still something to learn here. And the thing I have to learn is that but when somebody reacts to me like that, um, to just stay cool and try to make friends mm -hmm. or at least try to just neutralize the situation without descending into fighting it. Yes, yes. You know, because uh, yeah, my, my Qigong teacher used to say, you know, if you fight somebody, you already lost. Yes, yes. The real victory, she said, is in making peace. I yeah. think Ramana gave us an example there with the hornets, the story of him and uh, the hornets, where he was trying to get to that tree surrounded by bushes with hornets in them, and he stuck his arm in it, and the hornets uh, bit him and stuff like that. And uh, instead of pulling his arm out, he left his arm in because he said the hornets weren't finished yet. Wow, that's compassion. <laughs> yes. Wow. But I mean, this lady who taught me Qi Hung, you know, she could, she could drop you with a wave of her hand. She yes. didn't even have to touch you. You know, so, you know, it's like I made this point back in the uh, Golden Flower series that when you have a way to taste bliss, practically on demand, it changes your relationship with happiness. Yes. Happiness isn't rare anymore. It's not scarce anymore. It's abundant, it's cheap. All you have to do is just set up a certain mental configuration and boom. It's there. Boom, yeah, it's like yes. instant. It's always there. Yeah, so now it's not like you have to go hunting for happiness. Yes. yes. It's easy to get. So you, you change your relationship with it, you know? And the... Uh, I guess, you know, the same is true of power and love and everything, all these inner states. Once you know the secret, then you don't have to be attached to it anymore. You don't have to think mm -hmm. this is something rare and valuable. Right. Or this is something special or, or something. Yeah, it's just another thing, you know. And you can have it when you want it or really need it, but you don't have to be hung up on it and Mm -hmm. you know, obsessed with it like that. That's a real good realization. 
powerful. So I wound up actually thanking those guys, my enemies, uh -huh. for you know uh, creating creating the conditions where I had to realize this stuff. Yes. So thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Oh, and here's some here's some more karma. You want you want my karma? Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're still posting stuff on the internet here and there, but, you know, I don't care. They're, they're the ones who are suffering because they're attached to hate. Right, right. I feel sorry for them. I moved on almost a decade ago. But they're still there, like the monk. They're still carrying, carrying the, that nun. Carrying the woman, yeah. Carrying the woman, <laughs> yes. You put her down long ago. Really? <sighs> so, yeah. Now, it's almost uh, when the sun returns there to its original position in your chart. This is called Varshapal. And um, it means the start of a new cycle. And in my chart, the sun and moon are only like, what, three or four degrees apart. So it's not only the sun is returning to uh, the sun's original position, it's also returning to the moon's original position. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very powerful time. It's like, like beginning a whole new yearly cycle. And, you know, I didn't plan this, but I'm traveling to India and back. I'm getting a new house, you know, like all this stuff just kind of dropped out of the sky on me. I didn't plan it because I, I couldn't control the date that I left India. You know, they, they canceled my visa on five days notice. So I had to get out of there. And um, so that this just, just happens to be 90 days after that. And, you know, I didn't plan on getting a new house. I was just kind of casually asking about it. And my driver, just his sister had a house that was for rent. So boom, it just like fell into my lap, you know? And, uh, and it's affordable and it's nice. It's all redone and remodeled and it's beautiful. And, everything. Um, and I'll be able to handle the dogs. <laughs> It'll be another lesson for me. So all of this new stuff is happening, you know, just in, within a few days. And that's, happens to be the same time that the sun is returning to its original position in the chart. And, and I think what is most important is not the new stuff that I see happening on the outside, but the new stuff that I see uh, blossoming from within. The outside stuff uh, is a convenience what I see happening within you is uh, what matters most. You have good insight, Richard. <laughs> most people don't get it, you know, they don't notice. But uh, you noticed right away in the beginning and um, you called it, you know, and I think you're right. We'll see what the ultimate result is. I'm not going to claim anything or predict anything. Um, but I like the direction things are going in. Yes, yes. No direction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that with the no direction, uh, we're going to have to close for today and let you uh, hop on the giant silver bird and go to Chennai so you can uh, terminate
part of your relationship with India and come back for your new life in Sri Lanka and you will be approaching the April 3 to 5 time frame and uh, we're here watching to see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's going to be intense. That much I know. Uh, there's going to have some good aspects or to it and some difficult aspects, you know. Uh, I the guess only, the only difficult aspects will be letting go of those few things you're still holding on to. <laughs> they all got to go, you know. Everything's got lion. to go. I want my lion. <laughs> okay, well, too bad. <laughs> I know you know what I left him in India. Okay. I saw this coming and I said, I know I love you, Lion, but you know, you're part of the duality. <laughs> <laughs> and that's part and, of what uh, is difficult in this transition is some hmm. of the things that we have to let go of are things that we care deeply about. But it's still yeah. just these things that are transitory, and they're going to go away anyway. Anyway. Yep. So you can. So what's that? I always say, die now. Avoid yeah. the rush. That's right. Yes. So die now. Avoid the rush. And. Thank you for today, and we will see you uh, perhaps next week. I hope so. I should be in my new place. Very good. By then. Very good. Um, yeah. And I will send you some things, Nicholas, that are uh, jewels that I've discovered in my own archive. And anyway, very good to see you, and uh, have a Safe trip, Swamiji. Thank you, Richard. Om Tatsat. Om, Om Sat. Shakti Om. Om. Thank you. It was nice being in the Dragon's Den today. Very insightful. Yes. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, guys. Okay. See you, Nicholas. Be blessed. Thank you. Have a safe trip. Thank you. Bye-bye.